uh, what we were starting with is uh, we looked in the first lecture at what, what does it mean to talk about a single cavity mode, what does it mean to talk about a single mechanical mode. We understand this, uh, the logic behind that, that we always are dealing with in principle structures um, exhibiting many of these resonances and we deliberately assuming a high finesse for the cavity, assuming a high Q for the mechanical oscillator, we deliberately constrain ourselves to talk about uh, single modes in both systems. We uh, looked at the basic equations of motion for these systems, including the open system dynamics, damping, as well as the uh, necessary fluctuation, fluctuating forces acting uh, on each of these degrees of freedom. In the second lecture, we then coupled those two things together. We saw that the fundamental coupling in typical scenarios is nonlinear, meaning the Hamiltonian is cubic. There is a quadratic term in the equations of motion. And we uh, linearized this nonlinear dynamics uh, around a certain mean field, which we induce by driving the, the cavity. And this linearization led us to this final equations uh, of motion, which I wrote here, already in a rotating frame at the detuning of the laser from the cavity resonance and in the rotating frame with the uh, mechanical frequency omega m. So now we, in principle, are now uh, boiled everything down to two uh, harmonic oscillators. Uh, they are coupled to each other in a, a way which you can look at as a spring, so you can say, well, this is a boring system, okay? Um, but again, let me emphasize, this is a degree of freedom of a macroscopic piece of a solid, of one of the resonances, maybe the center of mass motion of a levitated sphere or of a ground scale mirror in a, a, a gravitational wave detector, or it could also be an atom trapped inside a cavity. So this as uh, describes our macroscopic uh, system, and it is coupled to a mode of the electromagnetic field in a way which we can tune. Remember that this linearized coupling G is some small fundamental coupling G naught times uh, the mean number, uh, um, the mean amplitude uh, inside the cavity. So alpha squared is the number of photons in the cavity. So we can increase this almost arbitrarily. The cavity is driven by vacuum fluctuations of the electromagnetic field. And this is a channel uh, which is, firstly, this is in an interesting channel because it is essentially a temperature zero in the optical domain. And the other interesting aspect is that this is a channel which we have access to. We can measure it. There is an output to this cavity, and this output we can measure. Okay, this is very different from the typical field we are talking about here. This is a thermal field. These are whatever degrees of freedom there are in, in this solid body. I mean, this is a field we don't have access to. This is just driving you know, uh, your, our mechanical oscillator with noise. But what goes out from the mechanical, the information which goes out from our mechanical degree of freedom into this bath of harmonic oscillators or whatever the environment is, is inaccessible to us. We cannot measure that. This is a channel which we can control and measure. And that makes, that makes the system interesting. Now, this is a macroscopic uh, degree of freedom. And that is a quantum channel which we can manipulate, we can measure. And if we increase this coupling G here sufficiently, as we will see in today's lecture, then this mechanical oscillator starts to be coupled more strongly to this well-controlled zero temperature field uh, of the electromagnetic mode, then to its thermal bath. And then we can do things like cooling this to the ground state. We can measure it to a precision. We can measure the me mechanical oscillator via performing measurement on light to a degree where we see the measurement back action in the mechanical oscillator, reaching maybe the standard quantum limit. We can uh, tune this interaction also in a way where we can create very controlled uh, entangled states between the mechanical oscillator and light, which is leaving the cavity. I'm not talking about the intracavity field. Uh, light leaving the, ca the cavity in this well-controlled uh, bath. So this is all hidden in this uh, um, 
uh, innocent looking linear equations of motion for these two oscillators. And in order to see all this, uh, it's uh, most convenient uh, to make yet another approxima approximation and go to what I call here the, the weak coupling optomechanics. So we assume that this optomechanical coupling is large, smaller than uh, the cavity line width. And this is a regime where the cavity mode here is a fast uh, degree of freedom, which is heavily damped out. Yeah? And if you have a heavily damped oscillator, subject to a certain force, which is here determined by the mechanical oscillator, then the cavity field will adiabatically follow this force. No, it's like taking a swing and moving it around. It will immediately respond to a, a slowly changing force. And this is uh, what is uh, contained in the adiabatic solution, which we derived uh, yesterday. So there, the cavity field at time t is identified as something which is in some sense proportional to the state of the mechanical oscillator, or to this amplitude of the mechanical oscillator B and B dagger at time T. So it's just directly proportional to the applied force. This is the meaning of this uh, adiabatic solution. On top of this, there will be noise. Yeah? Vacuum noise of the electromagnetic field. Now we take this adiabatic solution and we insert it into the equation of motion for the mechanical oscillator, which I wrote down here. And you will see that uh, when we insert A here and A dagger, of course, there, then there will be terms which will be proportional to B. If we insert A dagger here, then this B dagger will turn into an B. So there will be another term which is proportional to B. And whatever is proportional to B, we can move here. And whatever, uh, there will be a, a, a complex number multiplying this B, the real part of which we can interpret as a shift of the damping. The imaginary part of this uh, complex number we will interpret as a shift of the frequency. Of course, when we insert A and A dagger, there will be also B daggers and, uh, showing up here but they will be associated with uh, an, an oscillation frequency which goes twice omega m. You can see this here. So there is an omega m in the exponent here and there. And exactly for the B daggers, this adds up. And these are terms which I dump here and I neglect in a rotating wave approximation. So these are fast oscillating terms uh, which will average out uh, in the dynamics. But I included already here the shift in the frequency and the shift in the damping. And these are related now to these uh, uh, coefficients eta, which I introduced already the other day. So this is just a summary of what, what I already uh, taught you yesterday. The frequency shift uh, is associated, as I emphasized, to the imaginary part of a certain uh, complex number. And the optical uh, shift of the damping is associated to the real part of this complex number and this optical damping we can uh, obviously uh, decompose into two contribution which I call uh, gamma minus minus gamma plus and they show up also uh, in the noise and this is now radiation pressure fluctuations driving the mechanical <coughs> oscillator and I decompose that there is a certain technical step involved here which I jump over to save time uh, but I promise you that this A in uh, will be decomposed into two con contribution, A in minus and A in plus, which are independent white noise processes, both physically associated to radiation pressure. And there is this A dagger, notably. And this comes from the fact that I have to plug in here A dagger from the cavity, and A dagger from the cavity will have an A dagger from the driving field. Okay? And this will play uh, an important role in, in what comes now. So we can look at uh, the dependence of the optical induced damping and the optical induced frequency shift versus the detuning. So let's uh, keep all other constants uh, uh, fixed and vary the detuning. And I plot here the detuning uh, in scales of the mechanical frequency. This is in a regime where we are so-called sideband resolved. That means the ratio of kappa over omega is small. And then I also scale the, the optical damping 
to four g squared over kappa. And then you will see that there are two peaks. On the red sideband, we have uh, a positive peak at this lower sideband, where the optical induced damping takes this value of 4 g squared over kappa. And uh, the, uh, the line widths shift here in terms of g squared over kappa, which is a unit which supposedly is much smaller than omega m. Otherwise, we, we would be in trouble uh, with stability. Uh, this also takes on uh, large uh, values around the sideband, but this we should compare relative to the uh, scale of omega m. So in relative terms, this is typically uh, on the order of maybe uh, tens, tens of percent of the mechanical line width for, for high frequency oscillators. So it could be uh, a much more important effect for low frequency oscillators, like if we have a pendulum on the Hertz level, then this could be a really a dramatic effect, making turning a, a low frequency oscillator into a high frequency oscillator or making it even unstable, giving it a negative frequency. But for high frequency mechanical oscillators, this typically is not such an important effect, whereas the shift of the line width here, gamma optically, is a huge, huge effect. So the, the uh, intrinsic line widths of the mechanical oscillators with high Q values we're talking about here, the, think of the example of a megahertz oscillator with a Q of 10 to the 6, or even higher, 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8. We are in the hertz or subhertz re regime for the intrinsic line widths. And now we are giving this thing an um, uh, um, optical induced line widths on the order of 4 G squared over kappa, which can easily be uh, several hundred kilohertz or, or even uh, no. So can easily easily uh, be in the, in the kilohertz region for for these uh, scales I was uh, talking about. So this can be an appreciable fraction of the mechanical line itse itself. Yeah? If we are on the on the blue side on the red side band on the blue side band we see the opposite effect. We see that the optically induced damping is actually negative, and this uh, is the explanation for the instability. We have seen, well, I have seen, you don't see this here, um, but uh, I promised you that now this plot looks like we are unstable here and here. And the instability on this side of the detuning versus G, so this is this plot here, this instability is due to the fact that uh, on the on the blue side, when the uh, optical induced damping is negative and the whole system gets unstable. But let's uh, proceed uh, slowly and uh, uh, treat now each regime one after the other. And we start with the red detuning. Do you have any questions so far? So this would now be subject, subsection uh, F, the red detuning, where we are talking about cooling and state swap. So one thing we can ask for uh, in the uh, regime where delta is smaller than zero. And uh, in the following, I also want to uh, focus actually on the regime where, uh, in particular, delta is tuned to the lower mechanical sideband and we are sideband resolved. And this is the most interesting regime, so let's look at this right away. We can look at the steady state of the mechanical system. So what we do is we take this equation of motion here and we solve it and calculate the average of B dagger B in the long time limit. And I will not go uh, into detail of this calculation because we already uh, did essentially the same calculation. Uh, I re remind you that uh, in the uh, first lecture, I 
where we didn't have these terms here, this is radiation pressure noise, I integrated this equation of motion for a free mechanical oscillator subject to thermal fluctuations. So look up how this uh, calculation worked. And we used the solution of this uh, equation to calculate the average number of phonons in the long time limit. What we have to do now is essentially the same thing, but the system is now subject to three forces. Okay, but you can do this on your own. Important is that when we now look at normal ordered quantities like B dagger B, all these noise uh, contributions here. So the first one uh, will be also evaluated as a, or give rise to a, a normal ordered contribution B in dagger B in, which has a certain level of thermal noise. This is vacuum noise. So A dagger in A in for this noise, for noise process does not contribute here. It's zero. It's vacuum. But this one in the normally ordered expression will give rise to an anti-normally ordered expression. A dagger in A in. And this will be non-zero even if we are at temperature zero. Okay? So technically, the, 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 the step for the solution to this quantity, are the, the steps are the same as what you have seen. You just have to pay attention to what uh, processes contribute, in, with, contribute in, in which sense. And I directly write the result here. So this is the, the term proportional coming from B dagger in B in. And this is the term coming from the A in plus A in plus dagger. So it's a, a weighted sum of two occupation numbers, n bar for the thermal uh, background and one from the one unit of, of radiation pressure fluctuations. And then we have these uh, prefactors here, which we uh, already know. And now looking at, at this table here in the regime uh, we are focusing on, we see that gamma minus here uh, is essentially equal to gamma um, optical, and this is uh, for g squared over kappa. So we are sitting on this, on this left peak here. And this, if we uh, realize that the intrinsic line width is really a small scale here, will be much, much larger than the, the natural uh, line width gamma m, so gamma optical will be the, by far the dominating thing uh, as compared to gamma. This will make this a small term overall. Various uh, gamma plus turns out to be 4 g squared over kappa, kappa over 2 omega m, uh, 4 omega m, squared. And if we take so these are uh, easy uh, things you can estimate from the expressions I uh, gave to you before, then what we see is that the effective occupation number when driving on the, on the red sideband would be kappa gamma m n bar over 4 g squared. So essentially 1 over this optical damping, which is 4 g squared kappa. So we have here 4 g squared kappa. And in the uh, numerator, we also have gamma m n bar plus 
Here we have the ratio of uh, gamma plus to gamma optical. Gamma plus is 4 g squared over kappa, so that's essentially the optical damping times this uh, uh, per assumption small term kappa over 4 omega m squared. We can rewrite this quantity on the, in the first term. We can identify with the thermal cooperativity. So we see that the remaining contribution of the thermal bath is suppressed if the cooperativity is much larger than one. Uh, so when you crank up the coupling large enough such that the cooperativity gets larger than one, the contribution of the thermal bath will be essentially suppressed. And we are left with this second term here which is uh, the, uh, due to radiation pressure noise. So these are vacuum fluctuations of light driving the mechanical oscillator, whereas these are thermal fluctuations due to the phonon bus of the mechanical oscillator suppressed by the cooling. So let me point out that the meaning of the large cooperativity here is just that the optical damping, which is 4 g squared over kappa, is larger than gamma n bar, which is the thermal decoherence rate. So we cool the system through our optical channel faster than the system, the mechanical oscillator, is heated from its thermal environment. Yeah? So saying the cooperativity is larger than one is the same statement. If we are in the red sideband, if we are sideband resolved. And so, on. so all these assumptions, of course, go now into, into this uh, formula. So there are many ways of, of explaining uh, the uh, uh, mechanism of the sideband cooling, and, and I will not uh, delve too much uh, into it. What happens when we drive the optomechanical system with the laser is we create sideband photons. No, we, we, have, we have these fundamental processes where we take out or add a phonon to the mechanical oscillator. If we add a phonon to the mechanical oscillator, this energy is coming from the laser, and the scattered photon will go to a lower sideband, so we remove a little bit of energy, and this adding a phonon is a heating process. On the other hand, if we take out a phonon, we go to the upper sideband with respect to the laser, and this will be the cooling process. And when we detune by the mechanical line width from the cavity, then we resonantly enhance this process uh, of scattering to the upper sideband and suppress the scattering to the, to the lower sideband. And uh, this, on the one hand, cools, but there is necessarily this remaining heating, and this is essentially proportional to this rate gamma plus here, and this is what we see in our balance uh, of, the, of the occupation uh, number. So this is all I want to say about the cooling. Maybe one, one last remark. Uh, we could now say, wow, this is wonderful. We can prepare the mechanical oscillator in its ground state and uh, have a very coherent system because uh, apparently it's cold, but there is a catch. For the hot mechanical oscillator, the thermal decoherence rate Just to point that out, it's again gamma m times n bar. Now, does this 
the coherence rate improve when we do sideband cooling using the laser. Now we could hope that we diminish, diminish this, make it as small as possible, maybe one. So do we gain in the thermal decoherence rate when doing sideband cooling? Unfortunately, no. So the cooling works or is based by broadening the mechanical resonance. So from gamma m, we go to an effective gamma, which is essentially given by the optical cooling, which is much, much larger than gamma m. Whereas the effective occupation number, so the n bar, the relevant uh, number of occupation, goes to an effective occupation number, as we have seen. So let's forget about the, the small uh, heating term, uh, which is essentially 1 over c, which you know, is just gamma n bar over the optical cooling as I explained. And now if we uh, ask the question how much the thermal decoherence rate change, so we take the effective line width times the effective occupation number, well, the gamma optical drops out and we are just left with the original decoherence rate. Yeah? So while the effective of occupation number of our effective bath is small, our mechanical line broadened. So overall, we don't gain in this metric. Still, I think it's a, uh, it's a very, was a very uh, a fantastic achievement in the experiments uh, to go to the, to the ground state and uh, uh, cool these mechanical systems um, to their quantum mechanical ground state. But having achieved the regime of strong cooperativity, which is witnessed by cooling to the ground state, opens up other interesting uh, possibilities. And instead of going to the stationary state or looking at the stationary state, we could also look at the time-dependent dynamics. So let's take our effective equation of motion for the mechanical oscillator and strip off all uh, small terms. So we are still looking at the lower sideband delta being equal to minus omega m and a resolved sideband re regime where omega m is larger than kappa. And in particular, also on a regime where the cooperativity is larger than one. So what I uh, did is I go to the rotating frame where I take off the, the fast oscillation. So in principle, this is again this uh, tilde operator, I'm uh, switching back and forth between uh, these two representations, but when I'm not writing the frequency of the mechanical oscillator there, then it means I'm in the rotating frame with omega m, or the shifted omega m. And then there is the radiation pressure noise, and uh, here I uh, already uh, take out the, the relevant term where we have this uh, large, uh, the square root of the large optical uh, rate here for g squared over kappa plus there will be thermal noise. Which I don't write here explicitly. So I'm just asking what is the effect of this dynamics taking in the rotating frame with the mechanical frequency. Let's solve this and 
go to a time capital T. So this would be gamma optical times T half, capital T half, B zero minus I gamma optical, and then the integral zero capital T dt prime A in of T prime. Let's call, define this quantity at time t, capital T, which is under our control. So think of a pulse of light which we shoot uh, in the cavity at the, with the central frequency at the lower sideband. And this pulse has a duration capital T. And after time capital T, the interaction is switched off, meaning the optomechanical coupling G goes to zero. So light leaves the cavity and there is no interaction anymore. So then B out would be the mechanical oscillator at the end of the uh, driving pulse. And then what we see is that whatever was in the mechanical oscillator at time zero, which we could call B in, will be exponentially suppressed. E to the minus gamma times capital T over two. So if gamma is large, or gamma times t is large, then what was in the, um, uh, what the state in the mechanical oscillator will be damped out exponentially. But we will get a contribution of radiation pressure, uh, or noise of, of uh, some quantity related to uh, the incoming uh, light field. So how, do, how shall we uh, interpret this, uh, this integral here? So it's important now to get a feeling for what this uh, A in means. We are looking at an optomechanical system. And for simplicity, we will always think of this single mode cavity, single sided cavity, where we have a particular uh, one, a field of, of light talking to the cavity mode. So, but this is a continuum of modes. So let's cut this into pieces. And we can think of this as little pulses. And one of these pulses after the other will interact with this cavity. And this A in is something like a creation or an annihilation operator here for a pulse at time t. Yeah? This is how you should, how the feeling you should have for this process A in of T. So these are modes, temporarily localized modes, uh, which are described by this uh, annihilation operator. Now when we have an uh, integral over that, as we, we have here, oh, I'm sorry, uh, I forgot a, an, an important weight here. So this is E to the gamma opt T prime half A in of T prime. So this is important, of course. When we have such a linear combination, what we do is we pick out a particular mode of light which is coming in here, starting at zero and going to time t. So this is the, the, the piece which is arriving first. And this is the piece which is arriving last, but which is getting the most weight due to, the, due to this prefactor. All right? And we can do the following. We can define an operator A in, which is, I write here a certain normalization, an integral from 0 to t, dt prime, e to the gamma opt t half A in t. And this is one mode of the electromagnetic field. It's not localized in space anymore, in, in time or space anymore. It's an extended pulse of light described by this operator. 
This operator will have an adjoint, and we can check the commutator of this operator. So this would be 1 over z squared, 0 to t, dt, 0 to t, dt prime, e to the gamma optical t plus t prime, half. And then we have to take the commutator of a in of t and a in dagger of t prime. So I just take the joint here. Dagger means a dagger here. And then I plug everything in. This is white noise free field, delta minus delta t minus t prime. So this is 1 over z squared. 0 to t, capital T, 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 e to the gamma, optical t, times t. And we can solve the integral. z squared, 1 over gamma, optical, e to the gamma, optical, times t, minus 1. And now we want that this is a valid mode of the electromagnetic field whose commutator should be suggestion three? No, it's a stupid question. OK, it should be one. And uh, we can uh, assure that by, by choosing the, the normalization uh, properly. And we can read off that z has to be the square root of e gamma opt t minus 1 over gamma opt. Huh? Then this uh, ratio will indeed be 1. And this will be a valid mode of the electromagnetic field associated to a propagating pulse of light. Yeah? So in principle, we could, uh, with a magic machine, produce a, a, a funny state in that pulse of light. A Fox state or something more complicated. That's possible. Yeah? One can do that. So, defining this mode of light, we see this is nothing else as what we have here. This is what our mechanical oscillator is talking to up to the normalization. And the normalization we now have to put in. So, I continue this uh, uh, equation here. So, this is gamma opt half B in. And now it's, we could also absorb this minus i here. This makes our formulas a little bit prettier, uh, which the minus i, which we have here, uh, into the definition of our light mode. And now we come with the, uh, we have to normalize this, so we have to compensate by the set. The square root of the gamma optical uh, uh, drops out, and then we have the square root of e to the gamma opt t minus 1, but we have to multiply overall by minus e to the minus gamma opt t. So what is actually here is the square root 1 minus e to the minus gamma opt t times a. OK? This is the evolution of the mechanical oscillator after a time capital T. Its initial state is damped out with this vector. This can be really small. And then if this is small, then this square root here is almost 1. And what we see is that essentially B out is A in. Valid for gamma optical times capital T is moderately larger than 1. Moderately larger because we, are, we have this thing in the exponent. Yeah? So what does a, an equation like this mean? Operator B out is A in. I'm already saying that this is a state swap, but this is maybe not obvious to you. And we can convince ourselves of that. So we're always working in the Heisenberg picture, where we track 
where we track the evolution of operators. But what, what do these mean, things uh, mean in the, in the Heisenberg, in the Schrodinger picture? So let's assume we do what I said. We have this pulse of light, which is traveling towards the optomechanical system, which is described by A in. And this is described by B in. And after the uh, evolution for a time t, our mechanical oscillator is described by B out. I will talk about the light which uh, is coming out in a second, but let's first think about this. So let's say this uh, pulse is prepared in a particular state psi. And the mechanical oscillator is maybe initialized in the ground state. So this is light, and this is mechanics. We can write this as some superposition of Fox states, which would be a in dagger to the power n acting on zero for light. Huh? So this would be the state psi expanded in the Fox states, right? Now, our evolution turns A in into B out. Dagger to the end. Zero light, zero mechanics. Now, this B dagger out to the power n is exactly the state which we sent in in light, now swap to the mechanical oscillator. So I'm cheating here a little bit because we, I didn't show you so far what happens to the, to the state of light. This could be something, something more complicated, maybe some state phi or so, but in fact it's zero. And I will show this in a second. So this is why I'm saying this is a state swap. Yeah? So after time t, whoop, the quantum state goes over from the state of light to the mechanical oscillator. And it is a quantum state of one particular temporal mode, which is selected by the dynamics of the optomechanical interaction. Now, I uh, deliberately left out thermal noise here, and maybe also anti-stoke scattering, which is uh, so that the process uh, proportional to this A dagger in, um, and now, we should estimate when uh, such a clean dynamics actually would arise. So when can we expect that thermal noise is negligible. So after all, what I was asking for uh, this swap to be to be good is that the optical rate here, which again is 4g squared uh, over kappa, that the optical rate times the pulse length capital T, which we are looking, which we are uh, assuming here, is moderately larger than 1. So we could say, well, well, just let's take a very long pulse, okay? Then the gamma optical can be as small as, 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 uh, as it uh, may be. Uh, and when we can still make this large. But uh, of course, at some point, the thermal noise will kick in. Yeah? And, and if we uh, use two long pulses, uh, in addition to, to this clean dynamics, there will be the decoherence setting in, and this B out will be uh, disturbed by, um, by the thermal occupation, by the thermal noise uh, acting on the mechanical oscillator. So T is constrained, and uh, we should choose a time T which is smaller than the inverse of the thermal decoherence rate. Okay, so on the one hand, we want that 1 over gamma optical is smaller, moderately smaller than T, which turns that uh, 
uh, which, which assures that our interaction is sufficiently strong. This is equivalent to this assumption. But on the other hand, we really want that this time t is smaller than the thermal inverse of the thermal decoherence uh, rate, which uh, uh, is the decoherence time of our system. After this time t, uh, whatever we swapped to the, to the mechanical oscillator will be gone, will be erased by the thermal background. And if we uh, look at the outermost inequality here is what we, what we see here, what we need is that the gamma optical over gamma thermal should be much larger than one, and this is just the cooperativity. So having a large cooperativity means we have enough time to send in a pulse, which is much smaller than the uh, decoherence time, such that we perform the swap. Yeah? So having the large cooperativity opens up this margin to do coherent quantum dynamics before things uh, are decohered. This is the one, another meaning of the large cooperativity. All right, so we can do the swap. And now I want to go uh, back uh, to the question to what happens actually to the state of light. So is something coming out? of the mechanical of this system after this time t? And maybe does this uh, pulse uh, which comes out have anything to do with B in? The question is, of course, yes. This is really, uh, in, in, in the right limit, a unitary process where the two systems swap their states. So there could be some more interesting state phi in the mechanical oscillator, which would be swapped to a particular mode of the light field. And I just want to indicate briefly how one can find these, construct these uh, light fields. So what I didn't talk about so far when talking about optical cavities is how the outgoing field can be calculated from the incoming field and A. And I have no chance to, to derive this formalism, of course, here properly. But what I can do is motivate what is called the input-output relation for cavity, QED. It's this. So I again think of these fields as being chopped into pieces. and there is a continuous flow of these pulses to the, to the um, cavity. Some fraction will enter the cavity. Some fraction will be directly reflected of this mirror. And there will be a continuous flow of, of pulses out of that uh, cavity. And this input-output relation here is a boundary condition, tying all of these things together. This boundary condition tells you, it's a recipe, it tells you take a in of t, that is the pulse arriving at time t at this mirror, parts of it is directly reflected. And this is described by this uh, thing A in t. And then minus square root of kappa, the cavity line width A of t, that is the state of the cavity at the same time t, which happens to uh, leak through this mirror. And the interference of those two fields gives you the field A out of T leaving the cavity. This is how you should read this formula. It looks funny because you uh, have this square root of the, of the uh, cavity decay rate here. And you could uh, um, say, well, what about units? It is important that this is a dimensionless quantity. <laughs> Yeah, so A of T, A dagger of T is one mode, so it has commutator one. Various, these two are half dimensions. These are fields, so for example, A in 
of t, as I wrote down several times now, a dagger t prime is delta t minus t prime. And that means that the physical dimension of a, of a process a in of t is, well, the delta function has a, a dimension seconds. So that is second, uh, it's square root of second. Per second, per second. Another way of seeing uh, the, the meaning of this, uh, the physical meaning of these field operators is that this, for example, A out, but the same applies for A in, A dagger T, A T would be proportional to the photon flux operator, or is the photon flux operator. So it counts how many photons per second are flowing to a particular, uh, at a particular position uh, uh, here. So that means A uh, has to be uh, of the dimension one over root second. And then this formula here makes sense from a dimensional perspective. Now we are using it, this to calculate the output of our uh, optomechanical system. So we can take the input-output relation. And here we plug in the adiabatic solution. For the cavity field. And then we insert the solution for B of T. Now you remember that the adiabatic solution was somehow directly proportional to B of T with a certain proportionality uh, factor which we determined. Then we have in the input-output relation that there is the incoming light and B, which uh, also has some contribution, well, which is proportional to B, then B we solved, so this, this would be, has some contribution of B0 plus uh, the process A in of T, which we already have here. Then you take, you pick the right mode function, which you can guess by looking at the equations. This is just the recipe, I'm not going through all these steps, no? But it, it really, it's a systematic thing of uh, going through that, plugging, plugging in the solutions for A and the ones for B, which we derived. And then you look at the equation and you ask yourself, what is the right mode func temporal mode function I should pick out? And you can recognize it from the, from the formulas. And if you, in the same way as we did it for the, for the uh, incoming mode function, and you will find an proper outgoing mode function, which evolves like e to the minus gamma optical t, capital T, half A in, plus square root 1 e to the minus gamma optical T, B. So we will find the same input-output relation describing the evolution of the incoming mode to the outgoing mode as we found for the mechanical oscillator. Before that, we had here B out and B in, and on this side, A in incoming light. Now you see that in the regime we were requiring, uh, gamma optical times T is larger than one. This is essentially B in, and we do indeed swap the, the states. Yeah? You follow me?
Okay. Any question? So this is possible, and and yeah, it has been done. It's a routine, uh, uh, or less routine protocol now in experiments. And any sideband cooling uh, experiment is actually nothing else than, if you like, a continuous state swap. Yeah? Because whether you measure or prepare these uh, uh, these initial states, I mean, any if you come in with uh, with vacuum, then any initial uh, uh, light mode here will be prepared in vacuum and will be swapped to the mechanical oscillator in a time continuous uh, fashion. You don't have to bother about pulse shaping here. Yes. You can, yeah. So this is the power of the cavity input output relation. That works also uh, if A of T fulfills a nonlinear equation. In our case, we have a linear one, but you can use this also if you have a single atom in the cavity uh, and, and, or, or if you have an optomechanical system which would happen to be very strongly nonlinear. So this holds generally. Yes. Um, so the first thing which would matter when you're not in the resource tightening regime is that the, the anti-Stokes process, so the one where you heat instead of, of cool, will start to compete. And then it's clear that, uh, uh, for example, in the, in the state swap dynamics, uh, you will not only swap vacuum in, but you will also add a certain level of heating uh, due to the, the Stokes scattering. So, but it's a linear dynamics. You you can you can solve this still and and work out the input output relations. So uh, we did that um, perturbatively, but in principle, you can solve it analytically. It will get very complicated and painful, but in principle, one can solve it for the general uh, for a general linear uh, dynamics. I'm I'm just you know trying to convey the the, the most simple uh, uh, corners of this big. Uh, parameter space here. So the next thing we can look at is when we are detuned to the other side. And here we will have to face the problem, problem of instability, but we will also find the optomechanical entanglement. So let's think about the regime where we are blue detuned. And for simplicity, let's go to the most extreme point where we are sitting on the upper side band. And of course, obviously, uh, we are interested in the regime of a large cooperativity in the end. So in this case, the effective mechanical damping, which is gamma m plus gamma opt, will be negative. Uh, and this is the reason, reason for the instability. This is again the, the peak here. So asking for the stationary state now doesn't make any sense. Uh, it doesn't exist. Or to be more precise, uh, the stationary state is not described properly by the linearized model. The linearized model is fine as long as fluctuations stay small. When fluctuations get too large, we shouldn't use it. And this instability tells us fluctuations will get large. So we should uh, go one step back and look at the nonlinear model, and then you would see that uh, um, actually a stationary state exists also on the blue uh, side and uh, is uh, described by classical nonlinear dynamics, and you can do quantum theory around that and so on. But what happens in, in principle on this side is the system 
uh, rings up and goes to uh, uh, stable limit cycles. So you get a larger amplitude, and then the system just starts oscillating. I'm not uh, covering uh, uh, this nonlinear dynamics here, so I want to restrict on the linearized model. It's interesting enough. So stationary state is not an option, but we can look at the time-dependent scenario. So the time-dependent solution. So now the equation we have to solve is this one. I, I introduced here gamma as the absolute uh, value of gamma optical. Gamma optical will be negative in this case. Yeah. Will be negative in this case, so this will be again 4g squared over kappa. The optical uh, gamma is negative, so I take the absolute value. So we have gamma half times b. I write here explicitly minus gamma half minus. So overall, we have an anti-damping. And we can solve this equation again up to a time t. Now it would be gamma half, gamma capital T half b zero minus. And we could do the same calculation as before. We have a particular integral over the incoming light field, now with an exponential profile which is flipped. Before we had an exponential uh, rising uh, uh, profile, now we would have an exponentially uh, uh, decaying profile. And we have to pick out the right uh, temporal mode, and we have to find the right normalization and plug everything in here. I leave this to you as an exercise. What comes out of this exercise is the input-output relation square root of e to the gamma t minus 1 times a particular temporal mode a in dagger. So let's call this again b out after time t and b in, referring to the state at time 0. And I promise you, if you use the input-output relation, you will find a temporal mode which has a very symmetric shape for light. So there will be an incoming light field whose fluctuations will be amplified, e to the gamma t half. And this is A out. And there will be also an contribution of B in dagger in this case. So this is the input-output relation describing the dynamics on the blue sideband. So what does this mean? This is the Heisenberg picture representation of a two-mode squeezed state of an entangled state. In order to see this, uh, let's define an operator S, which is A, B minus A dagger, B dagger, and see how S, this is a unitary operator, transforms the operator A. So this is now disconnected from, from uh, optomechanics. This is just a little bit of opera operator algebra, uh, which I want to show you. You can work this out. This is another exercise. 
and let's put here a parameter r. What you find here is cosine hyperbolic r a minus sine hyperbolic r b. And you can also calculate how b transforms under this unitary. And you will find oh, B dagger and A dagger, importantly. So this unitary mixes A's with B daggers and B's with A daggers. So it's formally similar to what we found from our time-dependent dynamics. And now you can ask. Uh, uh, we can also now compare these things and read off uh, what they are would be in our case. The equivalent R would be something like arcus cosine hyperbolic e to the gamma t half. And now we can link this parameter R to our physical parameters gamma t, if you like. Now, having this uh, unitary here, which is apparently equivalent to the overall dynamics, which we uh, generate on the upper sideband, we can also ask, what does this thing generate in the Schrödinger picture? Uh, to know, to get an idea of what the states is, state is corresponding to these input-output relations. So in Schrodinger picture, we can take S and ask what happens when we apply it to a state where the mechanical oscillator is initialized in the ground state and light uh, comes in in vacuum. And you go through the algebra, and what you find is this state So you go to a superposition of Fox states where there is an equal number of Fox states populated in both systems, M and L. This is not surprising because we see that somehow this S consists of uh, products of these creation operators. So whenever uh, this product meets 0, 0, we will create a pair of Fox states. Now, in the, in the limit where r gets large, or much larger than 1, say that, which is nothing else than in the limit of gamma t getting large, this tangent hyperbolic r goes to 1. And we approximate this state, which looks like a maximally entangled state. I mean, this is nothing we will ever achieve because it's a state of infinite energy. Okay, But we approximate this uh, by making these weights here all more and more equal once we increase gamma t. We have to do that, again, within a time t, which is small as compared to the thermal decoherence rate. And we can do that. There is time to do that if the thermal cooperativity is significantly larger, sufficiently larger than 1. This is the same logic as, as in the case of the state swap. OK. Any question? If not, I would like to flip gears a little bit and use the remaining time to treat a third case, so we were now talking about um, cooling on the lower sideband, entanglement, instability on the upper sideband, and what remains is subsection H, uh, resonant drive, 
and this would be the standard regime of optomechanical force or position sending. And the standard quantum limit, which comes in here. So I'm not, I'm not sure I managed to, um, to tell you all I, I wanted to say. But let's focus again at the regime where we are in the weak coupling regime. Now delta is zero. And we find that here the shift of the mechanical frequency as well as the shift of the damping all are zero. So we are not dealing with these problems. And when we look at the equation of motion, we just have the free oscillators subject to its thermal bath, and then the light, the only effect of light is an additional force, which looks like A in plus A in dagger. So you remember in the beginning of the lecture, I introduced the quadratures for the light field, and now we see what acts on the mechanical oscillator is a particular quadrature. It's what we can call, no, sorry, what we can call the incoming amplitude fluctuation. So this would be 1 over square root of 2 A in plus A in dagger. So these are amplitude fluctuations. which represent an additional source of noise for the mechanical oscillator when we are driving the optomechanical system on resonance. We can also ask what happens uh, to the light field here. Or Maybe before that, let's uh, turn also to quadratures for the mechanical oscillator. So if we rewrite the equation for B here in terms of X and Ps, it would be minus uh, omega M times Pm, gamma M half Xm plus square root of gamma M X in of t for make the mechanical system. And let's put here an L in order to make sure we are uh, distinguishing here the quadratures for the mechanics and for light. So this is quantum fluctuations of light. And this is thermal fluctuations for the mechanical oscillator. And pm dot would be minus omega m xm minus gamma m of pm plus square root of gamma m in M of T, and then P, because of this I here, it is P, which is driven by the amplitude fluctuations of light. So that's the fluctuation, fluctuating radiation pressure force for the mechanical system. And we can now take the adiabatic solution for our cavity field plus input-output relation. To derive that the outgoing amplitude fluctuation in this case is conserved, 
So it's just the incoming amplitude fluctuations and the outgoing phase quadrature is the incoming phase quadrature plus square root of gamma xm of t. So this is really directly what you get from the uh, equations which we derived yesterday. You just have to decompose it uh, into amplitude and phase quadratures and specialize for the regime where we are on resonance. Right? Now what we see is that the phase fluctuation or the phase quadrature here gets an information imprinted on the position of the oscillator. And this is the idea of uh, the basic basis for uh, using an optomechanical system as a position sensor. So you just need to measure the outgoing phase quadrature. And knowing your system dynamics, meaning in particular gamma, which is 4g squared over kappa, we directly get an estimate for the position of the oscillator. If there is some force acting on the oscillator, this force will imprint its trace on the position, of course, and knowing the dynamics of the mechanical oscillator, its response function, we can, through the measurement of the phase quadrature, also infer the force. So that's the idea of the force sensor. Now we have the save this and go over. So imagine now we want to measure the position of the oscillator. So what we would do is we integrate our, we would measure the phase quadrature. No, we take the optomechanical system, we have the mechanical oscillator, we get the phase quadrature PL out of T. We set up a homodyne detector, not going into detail here, with the right local oscillator phase. I promise you we can measure with high, efficiently, high efficiency the outgoing uh, phase quadrature. And we would integrate it for some time t. So let's look at what we would measure here. We would measure p out l of t. We integrate it over a time t. I always want to work with normalized operators. So I normalize to the square root of t. And then what I have here is something like, again, a canonical operator p, which has standard commutation relations. So I can construct an x out of that. This is why I normalize with t. And then you would see that this is pl in plus square root gamma times t x m of t. And let's say x m of t for the moment is constant. So t, capital T, is small enough that we don't see a change in t. So t is small, meaning x m of t is constant. Think of a very short pulse. Knowing this measurement, what, how would we infer the, uh, the, the position of the oscillator? Well, we would divide by square root of gamma t. This is what we know. And use this as our estimate for the position. So the estimated position would be the scaled measurement result. So this is 1 over, so this would be the, the real position, essentially, plus 1 over gamma t square root p l in. So we can measure this quantity. And this quantity essentially corresponds to the operator we are trying to measure, the mechanical position, plus something which is connected to the shot noise of our measurement. This is the uh, noise of light. So this is added noise in our measurement. And when we want to evaluate the precision, 
of our measurement, we can just directly look at the variance, or the deviation of this noise. The variance of added noise is a measure for the measurement sensitivity. And it would be the variance of this normalized uh, uh, operator, which is one half over, so let's write it down, PL in squared. The variance of that, this is vacuum noise over gamma T. Yeah? So this is one over two gamma T. And that means our sensitivity, small, a small number here is high sensitivity. Yeah? So this is, uh, this is small, the sensitivity is good. We can increase our sensitivity or decrease the, the amount of added noise if we use a large readout rate. So if we use a large rate 4G squared over kappa and if we integrate for a long enough time. Of course, now there is a catch because we assume that T is small and XM is constant. And this is exactly the origin of the standard quantum limit in this case. So remember that the equation of motion for the mechanical oscillator, look back, I don't write here uh, the full equation anymore, but XM dot in the oscillator, of course, it couples to the, to the momentum, but it also, if we would look at the free mass, uh, we would have uh, the, the momentum uh, here, of course, being translating into a new position. And PM dot being driven by noise of light. So these are the equations I, I was uh, writing down before. So when we start to measure longer and longer, what we would see is at some point, and this higher rate uh, uh, gamma, what we would see is that we would disturb our mechanical oscillator at the same rate. And at later times of our measurement, we would see the noise of light, the amplitude fluctuations, fed through to the momentum of the oscillator due to the radiation pressure fluctuations, fed through to the position oscillator in our measurement record. And this will ultimately give rise to a second term here of added noise, which will limit the sensitivity, yeah, which will also scale with the uh, readout rate gamma. Yeah? So here the short noise is suppressed with the readout rate, but the back action of our measurement is growing with gamma. And there is a trade-off, and this trade-off is the standard quantum limit of continuous position sensing. So what to do now? I think it, the, the right way of analyzing these things is now to uh, uh, analyze the, the dynamics in, in Fourier space, where you really see the trade-off and maybe I just write down the result uh, with this explanation. You at least get a feeling for, uh, for this. So now we would analyze everything in Fourier space and use this to measure the position or maybe infer a force acting on the oscillator. And then we would evaluate the same sort of sensitivity which I wrote here. And this sensitivity would look like one over gamma. This is the same term as we have here. And now when we are talking about the sensitivity for a force fluctuation, this is the sensitivity for position measurement here for very short times. And we, when we do that for a force uh, sensor, then we get here also the susceptibility of the mechanical system in the denominator plus gamma. This is the contribution of short noise, chi m of omega 
and now this is all in frequency space and that's the sensitivity for a fourth at a particular frequency omega the susceptibility would be one over omega m minus omega plus minus i gamma m and this would be the back action noise Again, this is coming from the amplitude fluctuations here, which drive the mechanical oscillator harder and harder. The more power I use to uh, measure the position or infer this force. And now you see this trade-off. We have a term scaling like one over gamma and one term scaling like gamma. In principle, there is also uh, a thermal background for this uh, uh, sensor, well, but let's, let's leave that out. Due to this trade-off, we can find a bound. No, there is a clear minimum somewhere for this gamma, and this minimum turns out to be two over chi m of omega. This is now in dimensionless units. We could uh, multiply this now with uh, uh, proper zero point fluctuations and then turn this, uh, give this S uh, meaning uh, in or proper units uh, where we have a variance of what we measure that would be a force per bandwidth because we are uh, treating things in, in uh, the Fourier domain now per second. So the per second is the same uh, thing as we have here. This is uh, this one over t. And then the sensitivity means that within a certain averaging time, we can reach a certain precision. So this is how you should uh, read uh, such a statement about the sensitivity uh, being given by essentially here the, uh, the uh, susceptibility. Now the standard quantum limit, and this is this thing on the right hand side for four sensors has this shape of the inverted susceptibility. So here we are essentially constant below resonance frequency given by the mechanical frequency. Then this uh, goes down to uh, gamma m, the line width, and then for high frequency the uh, standard quantum limit scales like uh, the frequency. So these are the, the limiting values of the, the inverse susceptibility. All right, so this uh, essentially realizes the Heisenberg microscope. I was, I was telling that in the beginning. And gravitational wave detectors are supposed to reach the standard quantum limit uh, and they are typically working uh, far above uh, the resonance frequencies, which is in their case like several hertz, because they use this uh, uh, low-frequency pendula. They did not reach that because so far they are limited by what is also there, the thermal noise. And this is just the last line I'm writing, and then I'm, I'm done. We can also ask, the question, when is the back action noise larger than the thermal noise? The thermal noise will have a level of gamma n bar in the sensitivity. No? So we can also write this here, gamma n bar. So when is the thermal noise smaller than the back action noise in our position or force sensor? Well, this is the case when the cooperativity gets larger than one. Yeah? Working in the cooperativity larger than one means we are running our Heisenberg microscope in a fashion where we are disturbing the system stronger than, uh, so we cannot localize our electron or our mirror because we are measuring too strong. Yeah? So what we are seeing is essentially only the back action of our measurement. It's a very remarkable regime uh, once more. And the challenge for the people reaching to st uh, going to the real standard quantum limit would be to uh, have this smaller than 
than this value, and this has so far uh, not been achieved. Okay, so this uh, brings me to the end of my lecture. I started this with uh, talking about Einstein's uh, reasoning of why, the, uh, why photons uh, are particles, uh, which uh, was based on a Gedanken experiment uh, using optical cooling. Optical cooling is a reality. We can do that very efficiently, even to the ground state. I was mentioning uh, the uh, standard quantum limit. We reproduced that in our description uh, with weak optomechanics. And I was mentioning the proposal of uh, Roger Penrose for creating crazy uh, entangled states of light and mechanics. In a different way, this can also be done in weak optomechanics. So in reality, like all of these early ideas in maybe some other uh, form uh, have been realized in this field. And I hope you now have the necessary understanding to really uh, go into the literature and reproduce uh, the description of these things. Thank you very much.